Hello and welcome to another slide video from the Cornish Radio Amateur Club. Now this is a background video and today we're going to look at atoms, electrons and current. And I think it's worth emphasising that this does not form part of the syllabus but may be useful background, particularly for the full licence, uh, particularly when looking at semiconductors and valves. Um, so once again to emphasize you don't need to know this uh, in this level of detail for any of the examinations um, but many students um, ask about the basis of uh, conventional current and electron current and this can give you some background for that. So let's make a start. Um, atoms are the building blocks of matter. And on the screen there you can see a single red dot representing a proton. Proton is in the uh, center or the nucleus of an atom. So the center or nucleus of the atom contains one or more protons. Now protons have a positive charge. Um, and Next to the uh, proton there you can say a small green dot and that is meant to represent an electron. So orbiting the nucleus are electrons and electrons have a negative charge. Now the number of protons determines which element it is. The number of protons determines the element. And in an atom, there is normally the same, there are normally the same number of protons and electrons, particularly, or only actually, in its zero charge state. So in its zero charge state, an atom will have the same number of electrons as protons. So the charge of a proton is plus one, and the charge of an electron is minus one and so the two cancel out. Now the atom is mainly composed of space. The distance between the small proton and the even smaller electron is very very big. And an analogy that's been used is if the nucleus um, was the size of a P at the centre of Wembley Stadium um, then the electrons would be uh, orbiting around the perimeter of the stadium and would be so small as to be invisible. So if um, a, an atom is mainly composed of space, why doesn't it collapse in on itself? Well, in some circumstances it does, but these are very rare circumstances, thankfully from our point of view. Things like uh, proton or neutron stars or it's predicted that if you could ever reach absolute zero on the temperature scale, minus 273.17 uh, degrees um, Celsius or zero degrees Kelvin, then the uh, electrons would cease to orbit and matter would collapse in on itself. Um, but these are uh, exceptional circumstances and don't concern us. So, um, this diagram here or this animation shows an electron orbiting a nucleus and here we have a nucleus of one proton with one electron and it isn't just a simple uh, planet and sun orbit it's a complex orbit and the speed is very very fast it's about 22,000 kilometers per second so it um, is not as fast as the speed of light nowhere near but it's still very 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 fast. So with the speed like that it tends to form a cloud or a shell around the uh, nucleus and if you remember uh, the Wembley Stadium analogy well that uh, would mean that there's a great deal of space within the shell but adjacent atoms butt up against each other uh, at the shell. They don't um, merge into the, each other's shells. Now how do we identify um, elements? 
Well, you've probably heard of the periodic table of elements, and it's composed of um, blocks like the one shown on the screen. And we've shown the first block there, hydrogen, its symbol is H, and um, the small one at the top right hand corner tells us how many protons are in that element, one in this case. And the table is made up in rows, but the rows have spaces in them so that the resulting columns or groups um, arrange um, or organize the columns to elements having similar characteristics, for example, the noble gases or the metals. Now here's a row, the first row of the periodic table, and it only has two elements in it, hydrogen with one proton and helium with two protons. The next row is then made up with lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and finally neon. And this goes on throughout the whole 118 uh, known elements. Now the electrons are added by shells. Not all of the electrons can necessarily fit into the first shell. And here we show the atom that we made up before. It was hydrogen. There is its shell and the green dot depicts a single electron. This table here is the rule governing the filling up of the shells. Electrons don't simply uh, exist in uh, layers between the shells. The shells are quantum levels and um, the shells fill up according to strict uh, physical rules. So there you can see the first shell has uh, a maximum of two electrons. And if we look at that element there, helium, uh, we can see the uh, depiction of the shell with two electrons. And helium is in the vertical group there, the noble gases. It is very unreactive. It finds it very difficult, because its outer shell is full, to react and form compounds with other elements. As we go on and build up, uh, and we go over to lithium, because shell number one is full, the next electron is added into shell number two. And you can see from the table, shell number two has a maximum of eight electrons. But in this case, we've simply used one of the spaces in the second shell. And lithium is a metal. You can tell because it ends I-U-M. And it is very highly reactive and therefore not very useful for us in uh, electronics, certainly not as a conductor. And it is highly reactive because of this single electron in its outer shell. If we go on and skip a few elements uh, and move right over to the right-hand side of row 1, we see that we've filled up the uh, second shell with eight electrons. And the gas there is neon. Again, the outer shell being full of electrons makes it very unreactive, and so it's in noble gases. If we go on to the next level again, we get to um, uh, sodium and uh, a new shell is formed. So we've used one electron in the third shell. Once again, sodium is a metal and is very reactive. And this picture uh, continues right through the uh, periodic table. Now, if we have a metal that is useful to us, something like copper or something like that, um, and we have the atoms arranged in a piece of wire or something, and we add a, a potential difference to the wire, um, we will find that um, electrons will flow from uh, the negative to the positive, because unlike potentials attract and positive potentials repel. So you can see there the negatives going from left to right and that is electron current flow. 
the nucleus of the um, atoms remain stationary. So the atoms remain stationary in the piece of wire. However, from the outer shell, um, dissociated electrons are able to flow from the negative towards the positive. And this is electron current flow. Now, the fact that conventional current flow flows from plus to minus often causes confusion because uh, if the nucleuses are not actually moving, how can we consider the concept of a conventional current flowing from plus to minus? Well, if we consider that uh, current flow is nothing more than the transfer of charge, we can have a look at it in a way um, to visualize it, a bit like Chinese checkers. And if we had here some uh, five uh, nucleus, uh, nucle nuclei, perhaps um, with, with, um, uh, with protons, um, and we overlaid those with electrons, and we applied a, a potential to it, we can see then that the uh, electrons are pulled towards the positive, positive, and this is the movement of negative charge. But at the same time, the black square, which was on the right of the diagram, has moved to the left. So as the negative charge is moving from left to right, the positive charge is moving from right to left. So if we consider that uh, current flow is the movement of charge, it is equally as valid to think of positive charge moving in the conventional current direction from plus to minus. Now sometimes during the course you will have to think in terms of electron current flow and sometimes you will have to think in terms of uh, positive charge. Um, this is a, a strange thing that has evolved and sometimes I'm asked the question, well, why is it like that? Well, uh, as part of this series, background series, there's a little video about Benjamin Franklin which might shed some light on it for you. So once again, thank you for your attention and uh, good luck with your studies.